All right, so a very good evening to everyone watching. Uh, we hope everyone's doing okay. Thank you so much for signing up for the event. And we hope that today's event is going to be really informative for you all. Uh, so today I have with me uh, Shannon, Kriti, and Rishan. These are three medical students at the Taylor's University School of Medicine. And hopefully they'll share everything there is to know about being you know, a medical student and a bit about your journey to becoming a doctor. So uh, without further ado, I'd just like to pass on to our guest speakers. So once again, we hope you enjoy. Thank you. So hi everyone, um, I'm Shannon. I'm currently a third year medical student in Taylor's University. So today I'll just be giving you an overview and talking to you about a few things so that it gives you a better idea whether you want to study medicine or not in the future. So I'll just be following the agenda given to talk. So first would be becoming a medical student, what it takes and how did I decide to study medicine? Okay, so personally for me, I didn't really have um, a tough decision when I wanted to study medicine because ever since I was about four or five years old, um, I always told my parents I wanted to be a doctor and not sure why, but in specific, um, a doctor that treats children. Of course, during that time, I didn't know what is the term for that. Now I know it's called a pediatrician. So that's always my dream since young. Um, and also one more thing is I didn't really um, think of this thing like, am I capable enough to qualify to study medicine? Um, will I graduate and actually become a doctor? Uh, it's not really my the, the thought in my head ever since uh, four or five. I was always um, probably driven only solely by passion to help people, especially like younger kids. Um, one more thing is that people always told me when I grew up, um, do you, are you sure you want to become a doctor? Um, it's a very challenging journey and it's five years, you know, it's not three years. It's um, very tough. A lot of people um, study it and then they probably fail or what they, they decide to quit eventually. So are you really sure you want to do that? But my own character is that type where the more people say it's tough, the more I want to go into it just to know that is it really that tough or does it require something more? What, what should I do to, you know, make the journey a, a better one? So that's one of the things that um, drove me to study medicine. So what it takes to become a medical student, um, personally, the most important thing to me is passion. You need to have the passion and um, like you want to actually become a doctor. It's not like you want to show people or you want to be called a doctor because it sounds more prestigious, um, parents forcing you or something. Yeah, it shouldn't really be that, that way. It should be just 100% passion. Because even with passion, sometimes when we study, we find it very difficult to cope. So what more people who have to study it without passion and it's a five years very long journey and a journey with lots of struggle, ups and downs. So um, other than that, it will also take effort, of course, like hard work is one thing. It requires continuous studying, um, paying attention in class, and lastly will be time management. It's very critical, um, especially for me. Um, I'm actually uh, an athlete as well, competitive athlete ever since I was eight. So a lot of times I'm required to train like 10 sessions, uh, uh, 10 sessions a week. So morning and night, two sessions a day sometimes. So it's really um, tough for me, especially when it comes to time management. I have to somehow figure out a timetable every time I transit, like from primary school to secondary, secondary to um, tertiary education and to medical school. It takes a lot of planning on the schedule. So um, next one would be the pathway to study medicine. So I'm only um, like sure about Malaysian one is that you are required to get um, five Bs for IGCSE and SPM or SPM, um, and the 5B has to include subjects bio, bio, chemistry, physics, maths, or at maths, and any other one more subject. So this 5B is compulsory. Um, and if you are doing foundation in science for your tertiary um, part of education, you are required to get a CGPA of 3.0 in three subjects, bio, chemistry, physics, or maths. And let's say you didn't meet the SPM requirement of 5B in that subject, but you managed to meet the requirement in foundation in science, 
um, based on MMC, you still cannot study medicine because the, the requirement is that FIS, you have to qualify as well as for um, SPM or IGCSE. This is for your practicing in housemanship after you graduate. So if you are taking um, courses like um, Monash Uni Foundation Year or some Australian matriculation programs, the requirement would be an average of 80% score in any of the same three subjects, bio, chemistry, physics, or maths. So um, if you manage to meet the SPM requirement of 5Bs and the foundation um, that you take um, the requirement, then you are um, qualified to study medicine. So for the next one would be my personal experience um, in medical school. I will tell you that on my first year in medical school, especially semester one, it was a huge struggle for me because um, I took Monash Uni Foundation year um, before that. Uh, it was only like a 10 months course and things that we learned are like on the surface compared to in semester one medical school where everything was just thrown at you and it's full of um, theory, studying, and I'm not that type of person who can sit down 24-7 and keep reading uh, notes or textbook. Uh, sorry, sorry, just, uh, okay, just checking if we are live on YouTube. YouTube, right? Oh, yeah, we're, we're going live. Yeah. Uh, but why everyone who are clicking on the link, they are, they are not able to watch the live? Uh... Yeah, it's, 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 sorry, sorry, Shannon. I'm so sorry because I don't want you to like complete. And it's then okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, I, I sent the link to most of my friends and they, it's just showing like the front page to be or not to be doctor. Okay. Wait, uh, can you, you just send the link again? For some, because uh, some of them are already on it. Yeah, yeah. There's some people watching. Yeah. I just send the link again. Maybe you can just let them know. Okay. Uh, wait, where will you send it? Oh, I put it in the, uh, the Zoom chat. Yeah. Yeah, it's a new link, is it? No, it's a, I think it's the same one. Just, just try yeah. forwarding it again. Maybe they have to sign in. So sorry for those already watching. It's just Zoom sometimes. It's a bit tough. Yeah, I think okay. we just give it a few more minutes and then we can. Oh, or is it working already? Okay. Uh, okay. So I got one and it's showing this. Uh, I see. Okay. Mm. okay. I think stick to the link that I sent in the chat then. Mm. Okay. Because I think it's working. We have quite a few people. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll forward the link. Then. Okay. Okay. I'll forward yeah. the link. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. Um, it is working. I tried it out. It's working. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, then I think we can just continue then with that. Okay, sorry about the technical issue. So um, we'll continue from here. So I was talking about how um, first year when I entered and especially on the first semester, it, it was a struggle for me. Like I couldn't actually find time to complete just that day's lectures on that day itself. So um, it was really tough and it felt like I was studying, but the results doesn't reflect it at all. Um, and when I spoke to a few friends that came from A-levels, they didn't really have much struggle. So I discovered that it's because a lot of things like in chemistry, they have already covered in their A-level syllabus or even students from STPM. 
But because I came from a foundation where it's more surface, I had to actually put in more effort compared to them to understand just the basics. Um, and also, I would say that um, I didn't give up from there. What, what I had to do was to discover my own way of studying, like a new way. Like I knew whatever I was doing is not working out because it's not reflecting on my results at all. So I had to like find new ways, ask, um, talk to more friends, um, maybe seniors, and then they give the advice on different, different ways of studying. So I just experiment out like one by one. And my only goal at that time was to not fail. Whatever I experiment, just don't fail it. So um, eventually I came to this where in my preclinicals, I started um, printing out the lecture slides beforehand. And during the class, it helped me focus better. Um, taking notes on whatever the lecturer spoke about. But after two years, I realized that's not really uh, environmental friendly or effective way to do things because when I had to transfer from preclinical to clinical, all my paper notes was like everywhere. So I decided to invest in an iPad just to make my study life easier. Um, another thing was that it's always going to be a lot of up and down, especially when you are like pretty chill in the first two years and then suddenly professional exam in the end of year two comes up and it covers basically everything you learned since the day one of medical school all the way to end of year two. And that was like a whole lot of different thing for me. Like I couldn't actually memorize word for word like how I used to do it, word for word memorizing and then vomiting out in the exam. Yeah, that's not something I could do anymore when professional exam came up. So I had to again figure out a different way to approach this. But um, I don't really like stressing myself out too much. So when I can't really cope with it, I try to always take breaks in between. I'm not going to like force it through. It won't enter my brain anyways. So it's depending on yourself, how you um, work out your own study method and your time management. Um, since I'm in clinical school now, um, so far only been through clinical like one and a half semester. It was supposed to be a better experience or a different one from pre-clinical, but due to COVID, um, we didn't really manage to go to any hospitals yet. So it's somewhat similar to pre-clinicals. Again, it's more of studying um, not really much hands-on. We don't really get to club every day like we are supposed to from like maybe 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., like four hours a day of hospital clubbing. We didn't really manage to do any of those sadly because of um, COVID. But uh, once again, each challenges in life will give you something new to learn. So we had to learn how to um, apply what we learn, uh, find whatever ways we have. So like we club our own friends, we examine our own friends, um, plug our own family members and examine them. Uh, that's the only way like, I managed to find to like overcome those challenges in clinical school. And the biggest difference for me was in clinical school, it's a lot of self-directed learning, whereas in preclinical, there are lecturers that you know spoon feed you, give you the info. If you don't know, you ask them, they will just explain to you directly. It's not really hard to you know get hold of um, preclinical lecturers. But in clinical um, setting, the lecturers, mostly, most of them are like still practicing doctors. They don't really have much time and it's a lot of self-directed learning. So they just give you the learning outcome. You're going to find it in the textbook, read it yourself. If you don't know anything, you just text them and ask, but they're not going to just spoon feed you the information. Not all of them are that kind to do that. Um, so my advice for you guys would be like those who wants to study medicine in the future, first thing would be ensure that it is your true passion. You actually want to study medicine. It's not like you're being forced to or anything. Um, that's one way to make your medical school life a better journey, uh, enjoyable one. It's like even you are put with challenges, you're facing difficult times, it's not going to feel very bad because it's something you always wanted to achieve. So you will just take it as maybe, oh, it's just another challenge that I have to overcome. Um, one more would be, there are times where, you know, in your first year, you might fail, but that's not where you stop and give up. You have to always tell yourself, this is what you always wanted. Try to find a new way. There is always ways to come about these challenges. Maybe talk to a lecturer. Um, they will give you like advices on how to, how to go about it. Um, 
And I would advise that it's good to strengthen your basics. So there's a lot of us that um, sometimes we transit from foundation A levels or whatever we did um, pre-medical school. We tend to take maybe some gap years or a long break. During those times, if let's say you feel that you needed a long break, I would advise that if you want to study medicine, you, sh you can take the long break, but um, try to always constantly freshen up and revise on your basics, like chemistry, whatever you learn. It's going to be applied in your, especially your first semester. Um, you can just like maybe get an image on Google, like the Atlas Anatomy kind of image. You can read up on the bones, label the muscles, just basic things like it's going to help you in your first year. You won't feel um, very difficult like, if you manage to brush up your basics well. And for me personally, it's not always about studying. I don't believe in that. Uh, I can't sit down and study 24 7. It's not going to enter my brain. I have really short focus span. Like the max I can do is sitting down 30 45 minutes and studying. And then I'll probably need a 30 minutes break in between. So you, you know yourself the best. So you have to adjust on this. Um, I believe in always having a balanced lifestyle where I study, like maybe Monday to Thursday, I have classes. Then I'll just study Monday to Thursday. On Friday after class, um, that's the end for my week weekdays. I won't do anything after my Friday classes. I'll take the entire day break, go to malls. Uh, of course, don't go to malls now, like it's COVID, so stay at home, but do something else other than studying. And then on the weekend, I always have like, you know, family time, fun, and, you know, in between, we have nothing to do, just incorporate some studying of that particular week's lecture. So yeah, that's how I usually study and balance out my life. And I would advise to do some sports. It, it helps me a lot. Um, and one more thing is that it's good to work in groups. For me, I felt that studying alone in medical school is um, it's very boring. And you don't really have the drive. I, won't, I don't really have the drive to you know, study continuously if I'm working alone. So I believe in working in like a group of three or four, just a small group, and it makes my workload a lot lesser. So like, you know, my friend can study something and I study something, we go to uni, we exchange info, or we study the same topic and, you know, we do Q&A sessions. So it's, it's much like more fun compared to studying alone. And like from that Q&A session that we do, um, it tells you like, how much you actually gain or know from the lecture when you revise it. So you know your weak points, you know what to work on before exam. Ultimately, after each day of lecture, I will have to like do a speed reading of that same lecture on that day itself, just to like familiarize my, myself with the terminologies used. And eventually by exam time, I would have gone through the same lecture at least minimum three times. So at least 80% of the things are really stuck in your brain. So you don't feel like that stressful. And yeah, that's that's all from me. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can ask. Thank you. All right, yeah, so we, we do have a few questions uh, from you know the chat. Uh, one question is, are there any tips for the interview for enrolling to medicine? Okay, so um, for Taylor's Uni, when you have um, when you want to enroll into medical school, almost every medical school has a, like a small interview. They are not really going to question you for your knowledge. It's more of they want to know whether it's your true passion that you want to study medicine. And that's where they just um, give you advice like based on what you tell them. They just want to know um, what is your take on studying medicine um, is this really something you want? And from there, they just give you advice. But in terms of testing knowledge, they actually only maybe ask you one or two very simple questions that you can answer. And even if you can't, you are still going to make it into the medical school. It's not going to fail you for, or stop you from entering medical school. So there's nothing to worry about that. All right. And another question is, if I'm not sure if I should study medicine or not, then you know, how, how should I go about deciding if it's right for me? Um, usually people who are not sure whether they are going to study medicine, I, they tend to go into A-levels. I think because it's a longer course, it gives them, buy them more time to think. But if you already like chosen your foundation or already almost finishing your um, like pre-uni um, courses, then you might want to think 
like whether um, your interest is in science stream, whether um, you feel you're capable to continue science stream in a more detailed way, if you're finding it like super hard and, you know, studying really, really hard and you're still not, you know, getting the results that you want, then you might want to rethink to yourself. Can your passion drive you like enough to make you work hard until you can reach uh, medical school and like maybe go out throughout the process uh, of studying in medica, uh, studying medicine? Yeah, that's my advice. Like, you can, you take your time to think or you can just um, maybe get hold of someone who's studying medicine to give you an overview of what they do in semester one, semester two. So you have like a brief idea whether you feel you want to actually do it. Is your interest or not? All right, thanks for that. So that's all the questions for now in the chat. Uh, just a reminder that, you know, feel free to go leave more questions if you'd like. Um, but yeah, we can move on. Okay, uh, thank you, Shannon. Just uh, checking, am I audible? Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hi guys, I'm Kirti and I'm a third year medical student, Taylor's University as well. Okay, first of all, let me start with thanking all those frontliners for out there working for us, policemen, nurses, doctors, and stay at home, stay safe, and take care. Okay, all right, so moving on to my experience, or should I say, what drove me? what made me to pursue medicine. First of all, I would say it is not about the name, it's not about the fame, it's about the passion. So in simple words, if you want something, you go for it, you do everything it takes. And me, myself, I was inspired by my own pediatrician when I was young, I was diagnosed with bronchial asthma. So then yet my own pediatrician, she did not prescribe me any drugs, she just asked me to manage my lifestyle. She asked, she advised my parents to manage my lifestyle, modify my lifestyle. And right now, I do not have bronchial asthma. So that's, those are the things that drive me, motivate me to be a good doctor in the future. Okay, so one thing I would like to share that my professor, okay, a professor of mine, he's a gynecologist as well as an obstetrician. He shared this case with me where in his experience there was this lady who actually approached him saying that she was previously diagnosed by another hospital by a doctor by a, a gynecologist himself that she was having endometrial cancer uterine cancer okay so and they were actually preparing to perform a hysterectomy which is a surgical removal of the uterus which means she will never be able to get pregnant or to bear any child in the future okay so, and she was around 30 plus. So when she approached professor, he could have had just look at the diagnosis and say, okay, go ahead, perform hysterectomy, but he didn't. He went through each and every single test and investigations that are needed on the patient. And you know what happened? Everything came out clear. The results were unremarkable. So, in this scenario, there's two types of doctors. If you're going to pursue medicine, you decide what kind of doctor do you want to be. I decided, and that's why those are the things that motivate me to keep going to be a good doctor once again in the future. Okay, so it's not about the name, it's not about the title doctor, but it's whether are you ready enough to be able to carry the responsibilities to save people's lives because not all heroes wear capes or have superpowers that are ones created by pure passion, gentle yet firm, those who sacrifice their time, their family time, energy to save people's lives. They are known as doctor. So if you want to be one, make sure you are not going to come and pursue medicine just because of fame, just because of money, just because of the title doctor, or even because your parents or your family, or your peers are pressuring you. You make the decision. It's your passion. Simple. Just two things. Passion, commitment. Medicine is a lifelong learning thing. It does not just end after five years. It continues. You learn every single thing again and again and again. A single disease can present with different symptoms each and every single day. So that's what you want to find out. 
you do not want to sit in front of the patient and telling him, oh, okay, this symptom is new to me because nowadays everything is in Google. So if you want to be a doctor, you better be better than Google. That's my advice. Okay. Okay. So moving on to the pathway to become a medical student, Shannon actually covered everything. Just adding on from my own personal experience. So the main part comes in, this, is, this applies to local students. Yeah. Okay. So because I'm not sure of the international students, how it works, IG and all. So for local students, this is how it works. When you're in form three, you're 15 years old, right? So that's when you decide whether you want to pursue, you want to continue your career or you want to you know, end up in a career which is in science field or otherwise. Okay, so you choose either science stream or art stream. Okay, then you enter science stream. And as Shannon mentioned, you need to have five Bs in SPM. The main three Bs comes from your chemistry, biology, and also physics. And the other two B, you choose which one you want to have, right? It's not about, okay, you, I have to score Bs just to get into medicine. No, why not an A? Why not an A plus in SPM? You target high. So even if you fall, you fall you don't drop or you don't fall too low. Okay. Okay. So then what I did was after SPM, I enrolled myself in the foundation in science program at Taylor's university itself. And then one more thing is that your pre u courses, I'm not sure for A-levels because they do not look at CGPA, they look at grades, right? So as for A-levels, STPM, you look at the CGPA or GPA, but CGPA, MQA's qualification is 3.00. You fail to get 3.00 or above it, you do not qualify to enter med school. And then what happens next is you decide which med school do you want to go. Malaysia, that's a lot. That's plenty of med school. Okay. I'm sure not many people know that Taylor's University itself has its own medical school. Okay. So then you enter med school and they have their own process. For example, at Taylor's University, we have our own interview session and then you pass the interview session and you're a medical student officially. So my experience as a medical student, right? For me, SPM was hard because, you know, those of you who have done SPM, you know how it feels like to do SPM, all those pressure. But when I came to foundation, it was a smooth flow because it was just one or two more things to be added into foundation in science and it was smooth. So then the real challenge was when I entered medical school. I thought I could just slack around and just study at the last minute. So I'm not going to say the grade I got for my very first semester exam. You guys can figure out by me just saying I slacked a lot. So I got a shock and that's when I decided to change. Because I study, I do not make notes. I do not make notes. I do not even print the notes. What I do is I download the notes, the respective notes by the respective lecturers, and I just browse through or read through. For example, I'm active in athletics. I go to the gym. I play futsal. So wherever I go, your gadget is with you, right? So when the notes in your, is in your gadget, instead of going to Instagram, you can. I'm not saying it's wrong. You can. But why not? Just go to your documents or your Google Slides. Just browse through. The thing is that you just have to look at it and just look at it repeatedly, okay? So that's how it goes into my mind. And then just keep it aside. I do not put pressure. I do not make notes. I don't study for hours. I study for a few minutes and that's done. I go and enjoy. In terms, I do sports. Okay. And spend time with my family, my friends. And then I come back. So wherever I go, my gadget is with me. And I look through the slides whenever I want to. It's not a must. It's you make the time for it. You don't wait for the perfect time. If you're going to wait for the perfect time, it's not going to come until you finish your med school. You don't want to regret at the end. Okay. So one, another thing is that you do not memorize things. Instead, you understand it. I'll give you a scenario. A pregnant woman with um, 32 weeks of gestation. Okay. She comes in with bleeding. Bleeding. Huh? Just bleeding. So if you have had read all those things, you know, by textbooks, by textbooks, by notes, Google and everything, 
we would know that, okay, so if a patient presents with bleeding, so this is this, this is the diagnosis, okay, so it can be ectopic pregnancy. Okay, so how many of those patients presenting with bleeding have the same diagnosis? Once again, it comes to different symptoms. A single disease can present with many symptoms and you can get many signs as well from the patient herself. So it can be ectopic pregnancy, it can even be miscarriage, or it can even be placenta previa. Do make the decision. Do not rush into making the diagnosis. Instead, understand the patient as a whole. See, it's simple. We are treating human beings, okay? So when we are treating human beings, we treat the patient as a whole. We are not just treating her symptoms. We are not just going to treat her signs or the disease itself. We are looking at the patient as a human being. We are going to save her life. That's what you need to get in here, okay? So, and so that's it. That's it when it comes to, you know, my experience about a medical, uh, being a medical student. Next is the advice that I would give to the ones who aspire to be medical students. There's one thing to add. You, once again, look at the patient as a human being. And when I say this, I mean it as Think them, think of them, sorry, think of them as your parents, your mom, your dad, your sisters, your siblings, your close one, your loved ones. When that happens, you do not have the chance of just, you know, the thoughts where, okay, this is just another patient, you know, it's okay. Her family will understand if at all she ends up passing away or they end up losing her during the operation or during the disease management or treatment. No, but you do the same thing when it's, your loved ones, ask yourself, would, it, would you do the same thing if it's your mother? No. Again, if your own mom or your dad comes in with a history or with a lab test saying that they have this, this, this disease, would you just say, okay, so this is the management, this is the treatment, or would you say, no, come, I'm going to have another test done on you, another investigation done on you. Think of each and every one of the patient as your own family member. That is what matters. Nothing else. It's as simple as that. Okay. So um, another thing is that brush up your communication skills. It's very important, especially if you're going to practice in Malaysia. One language that you have to, I wouldn't say master, that you actually should know, you should be able to understand and converse in it is uh, Basa Malaysia. As most of the patients here, yeah, I'm talking about government hospitals, they rarely speak in English, okay? So if you are an international student, you're going to be studying in Taylor's University, get your local friends to help you, okay? So one thing that I need all of you to understand is that, see, I'm not sure of how you have been through all your pre-university studies, your high school, your primary school and all. Maybe you have been a very competitive person. Okay, you have been getting all A straight A's, you have been the top, you have been the you know, icing of the cake or whatnot, right? Once you enter med school, you drop it. If you want to be competitive, you be competitive with your own self. You tell your own self, okay, I scored this grade in this semester exam, next semester exam, I'm going to get better grade. You do not compete with your batchmates. Your cohort is your family. Five years, guys, five years. It's not just one or two years, okay? It's not just one or two years of your pre-university course that you compete and end of the day, you know, you guys separate, you guys go into different pathways. No, it's five years. And it's not just five years, you guys are going to end up in the same field. Who knows? Today, you're going to have a graduate. One person, the next day, is going to be a DG. Do you want to end up in those kind of situations? No, right? I'm not, okay. That's not my main point, actually, coming back. For your own benefit, do not compete. You compete with your own self. You be the best version of yourself. You be the best version, best doctor that you can be. You don't have to be better than the other person. Med school does not work that. Okay, medical school is the apex of um, educational achievement. So whether you are at the top or bottom of your class, it does not matter. You're already at the top. You're in med school, guys. You're in medical school. So you are a chest of full of gold. The goal, the goal on the bottom is valued just the same as the gold on top. So again, this is not high school. This is not pre-university course. You have already made it. You have already made it into med school. Congrats, okay? So 
while the weight of medical school starts to get heavier on your shoulders, you need to realize that there are no failures here. I'm talking about failures in real life. I'm not talking about failures in failing grades. Even if you fail a grade, you still have a chance, which I personally think you shouldn't be facing failure if you have the passion. Stay. The uh, exam is extremely hard. So, okay. You, end the, you ended up failing. That's not the end. You still have got another chance. Tell yourself. Wake up. You go back to the mistakes that you have made. Mend. Okay, so me, myself, on top of all these uh, extracurricular activities that I'm involved in as well as med, med school, I'm a religious person. So one thing I would like to add on is it does not matter what religion you are from or what your religion you are in. Pray. Have faith. Med school is tough. I'm saying it straightforward. Okay, I'm not going to cover it uh, by saying it's easy. You can, you can do this. Okay, it's hard, but it's not impossible. I don't believe in such thing as impossible. So you can do this. So pray, have faith, because many people out there in the hospitals, they're looking for a miracle. People with cancer, stage one, stage two, they're looking for a miracle. So you be the miracle for someone by saving their lives, by sacrificing your time, your energy, the life given by the God himself. Okay, that's your superpower. You be you. No one can be you. That's how unique you are. Okay, so I think I've covered most of it. I hope you guys are motivated after listening to me. Okay, so I wish you all the best. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Kirti. There's around three questions. So the first one is, someone asked, any tips for memorizing anatomy and histology? Okay, uh, anatomy and histology, memorizing. Okay, um, <laughs> okay uh, first of all, uh, from my experience, don't memorize. Okay, don't memorize. Because um, anatomy is just huge. Okay, anatomy is just huge. You start from cells, tissues, organs. Uh, then you come as a whole system. So it's huge. You have every single artery, veins and all. So coming to the point, what you do is you draw. Anatomy, what you do is you draw. You have diagrams. Diagrams is what makes anatomy. So you draw. Learn to draw. When you draw, that image gets captured in your mind. Okay? For anatomy. Do not memorize by reading books, textbooks, slides where you go, okay, so this artery is at this uh, plate. Okay. Uh, this, the insertion of this artery is at this muscle. Okay. This muscle has this nerve uh, supply and all. Don't do that. You draw. Okay. Even, even if you're not a drawer, I am not, a, I'm not good at drawing. I end up drawing because I know what I drew. I understand it. When I sat for the exam, when the question was asked, I remembered what I drew. Not the book, but what I drew. Okay, so anatomy. One thing that you can actually improvise on is, or improve on is draw. Every single diagram that you see, draw it out, label it, label it, draw it out, label it, draw it out. Label it. Okay, for histology, histology, you can't draw it out. That's too much actually. Uh, histology, you pick up the main key points. Okay, for example, you've got five um, gross morphology or microscopic morphology of a disease. You pick the main ones, you get them here. So when it comes, you can just, if, if it's common, you can use it. It's a plus point for you. If it's not, if it's specific enough for the disease, then you get it in here. You don't draw it. Okay, histology, you don't draw it. Histology is more like physiology. You understand it. You relate it to that. For example, um, let's see, uh, fibroids. Fibroids in pregnancy, you see bleeding. So what's the gross morphology? Bleeding, clots. So that's how you see. You see, you write what you see. That's histology. Okay. Physiology, obviously, you have to read through. You have to understand. Okay. Um, what else? Um, okay. Thank you. And the next one is what happens if you lose motivation in studying or you has a, or you have a sudden loss of interest in medicine? Okay. In this kind of situation, you take a break a day or two, you sit down, you don't need your friends. You don't need your family. You need only yourself. Sit down, ask yourself why you started in the first place. There must be a reason, right? 
there must be a reason. Maybe it could be something that happened to you or your family that could have had, you know, motivated you to take up medicine. Maybe you want to save people's lives. That's, it could be as simple as that. Or maybe you want to be the best pediatrician in the country. That could be as complex as that. So ask yourself why you started in the first place. Then you move on. Okay, that's enough for you to actually go back to where you stopped. Nothing much. Sit down, think of why you started in the first. Okay, so yeah. Okay, thank you. The last one is, do the grades for preclinical years count? Um, do the grades for preclinical? Okay, so in TLS, right? Okay, um, I'll just briefly explain what, how TLS works. Taylor is five years of med school. The first two years is theoretical phase where you just read basically everything, anatomy, physiology, pharmacology, everything is based on theory. So preclinical phase, you have block exam. For example, the first block is biological basis of medicine. Second would be musculoskeletal block. So each and every block, you have your own CGPA, okay? So semester-wise, these two blocks add up to your grade. So when does grade actually matter is at the end of your first year. Okay, at the end of your first year, you should be getting 40% or more at the end of your first year. Okay, so you have semester one, semester two. In total, you have got about five blocks in first year itself. Five blocks, yeah, first year itself. And all these five blocks, you accumulate, you accumulate all the marks. So it should be 40% or more for you to proceed into second year. Okay, so that's for first year. Then at the end of second year, if you have professional examination, PE1, we call it. For PE1, it's the total of two years, all those blocks. Okay, for example, we have got 11 blocks in total. So all those 11 blocks will contribute up to 20%. And your PE, professional examination, you have to score. And those great marks percentage plus with your 20% that you already have, you have to plus it and you have to get 50% or above. If you do not, then you have to retake a semester or the year, it's up to you, okay? Or uh, if you get 50% or above, you go into your third year. And onwards after that is clinical phase. After that, it's, I would say it's much simpler because it's just basically things that you see on daily basis instead of sitting down, reading textbooks, okay? So yeah, grades matter, but do not pressure yourself. I have to score A, I have to score A. That's good, you score A but don't just make it as the main goal. Learn. It's okay. Even if you fail your first semester, second semester, it's okay. Sorry, first semester is okay. Second semester, if you fail thoroughly, then you have to repeat back, right? So if you fail your first semester, it's okay. You still have got three blocks to cover up. Learn where you made mistakes. So yeah, that's basically it. All right. Uh, thank you, Kriti. Welcome. All right. Um, so now I'd like to invite Vishan. All right. So uh, I can start, yeah? All right. Uh, Kriti, you can stay if you want. Uh, I'll just give a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Vishan Charles. Uh, of course, I'm in uh, Taylor's University School of Medicine. I'm currently in my fourth year and my eighth semester, all right? All right, so uh, uh, thank you, Kirti. Thank you, uh, Shannon. Thank you, Pre-Med uh, Club. Uh, Kirti and Shannon did a great job. They covered a lot of things. I think uh, I don't have to cover much then. Uh, good job. Uh, so I'll just cover what uh, I have in mind, all right? I'll speak mostly about my experiences in uh, med school, which honestly, it's been four years. It's, it's, it's a long journey. One more year to go. All right, so uh, first I'll start with what they all started, what it takes to get uh, what it takes, you know, it takes to do medicine, right? So uh, what I feel, think, right? What I think is you really need to know that you want to do medicine because that is really important. If you're very unsure, then I know uh, like the people previously, they did mention, right? Don't take a gap and all. It, that's a good advice because you need your knowledge when you're going to start medicine because it's, it's, it's a heavy, it's a heavy degree, right? It's a heavy course. So uh, you can take a break if you need because making this decision, it's a huge decision and uh, you don't want to regret the decision because it's going to be five years. Right? You don't want to go through two years in and then regret it because then I would say it's too late because you just struggle for two years and then now you want to get out of it. 
uh, if you if, if you have passion in something else, then of course go ahead. But that's why I say it's always better if you think it through, better to just know you want it, all right? Because it's it's not an easy ride. Definitely, uh, five years. Up, there's a lot of ups. I'm not gonna say there's no ups at all, but there's also a lot of downs, right? Uh, and it's 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 a long journey, all right? Uh, you also need a lot of determination. Uh, so for people who can be like you know slacking off every now and then, uh, I will admit uh, I can be like that too. So uh, it's not easy to do a course like medicine if you slack off easily, all right? Because uh, like I said, uh, you, you need passion. Okay, so like uh, like Katie mentioned, Katie gave us a story about his uh, his uh, childhood. I actually, I'm, I also have asthma, Katie. All right, <laughs> uh, but like. Uh, you see that these kind of things uh, gives us motivation, uh, gives us an idea of uh, how uh, how the doctor helped us when we were younger. We want to help others in the future, right? So uh, as I say, uh, you need you need a direction. So passion, determination, right? It's very important to do this cause, right? Because it's like I said, I mentioned. I'm, I'm going to say this a lot of times because it's not easy. Uh, so you have to know that you really want to do it, right? Because it's it's a very important thing, right? Uh, people always say that. Oh, oh, you're doing medicine, or you must be smart, you must be a brilliant student, right? Uh, very bright and all, but they don't know the struggle you're facing, right? So uh, that is uh, important. You, 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 will, you will know it when, when, when you start, right? Uh, so now I'll tell you how I started, right? How I made the decision. It was not easy. It was a tough decision. It took me a while, but uh, I got there. Uh, it took me a while, so I even enrolled late. I enrolled late. I joined in a month late, right? So I went for my interview, and uh, as I went for my interview, they started asking me, you know, why why I'm late. Uh, I could have started in earlier, but they still they still they were still accepting me. They just want to know why it took me a while because they they need to know that I can cope. Right? So that that's that's important. You see that they it seems like they're attacking you, but they're not. It's very important questions. Uh, they want to know if you can cope with what you've been, uh, what you what you left out before the one month. Right? It's a lot. So that's important. Right? See. Uh, I know you people. Some people are just like, oh, since ever since I was a kid, I I want I want to do I want to be a doctor. I like helping people. This and that. You now some people say, I want to do it for the money. Go ahead, whatever it is, man, just do it, right? But know that you really want to do it. Okay, uh, so think it through properly, right? And uh, no slacking off, right? So next, I'll move on to the uh, pathway of studying medicine. Uh, I think uh, Shannon covered that pretty well. You do your pre-use, then you get into uh, whatever pre-use you can do, whatever whatever it takes, right? Make sure you meet the requirements. That's also very important. Make sure if you want to do, if you already made up your mind before you started pre-use or while you're doing a pre-use, make sure you if already you already have your targets, right? Because you need to know your where you what you're good at and what you're not good at, so you need to improve yourself, right? Uh, I know most of us uh, in doing medicine, we all hate maths and physics. That's why we're here. But uh, don't be fooled because uh, we have biostats, so yeah, uh, maths will always haunt you. Uh, so you, you need to know. You need to know all these things. So if you ever need advice, join things like this. Like uh, that's why I say, uh, good job, uh, pre med club, right? Uh, so after after your pre u, uh, you will go for your interview, and that's when they'll decide if uh, you are fit to do medicine. So most of the things they look at is uh, your grades for your pre u. If you meet the requirements, if you meet the requirements, you're most likely already in, right? But they want to see if you you can do it you know because not everyone is built for it you know they don't i know people don't want to hear this but not everyone is built for it because it's not easy it's, it's a very tough journey right? it's a long one too so uh they ask you uh if you want to know what kind of questions they ask in interviews and all uh, i got asked some chemistry questions some bio questions and also most of them just asking me why why i came in late if i can cope it's not going to be easy they keep reminding you that so i'm going to do the same you know what the like to say to me i'll do to you guys right and so once you once you start, there's uh, two phases: preclinicals and clinicals. And uh, let me just be clear: the very different, right? So the the preclinicals you do two years. For me, I think uh, for me it was different compared to Kirti. I was I'm, I'm from batch thirteen. Kirti is from batch sixteen, all right? So uh, for for me, we did two years. Actually, I didn't count how many blocks there were. There are quite a number of blocks. But it's you think you think preclinicals is tough. And then, because uh, your seniors tell you, your seniors tell you, hey, once you come to clinicals, things are going to be great, you know, it's going to be chill, it's going to be easy going, but no, those are all lies, right? I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's not going to be as easy as you think, right? Preclinicals are really tough because they're giving you your, your foundation, your theory, right? You need to know all of this. And uh, you might get 
mad or angry when they ask you too many questions. So like, like the littlest thing, like when you read something, uh, and you're just like, oh, this is such a small thing. They won't ask. Uh, they won't ask us in the exams, but then they ask you. So, yeah, do not just expect everything. All right. So preclinicals, and then after two years of preclinicals, you have to sit for the PE. So for those who have already made up your mind, you want to do medicine, all right? In Taylor's University, you have a one month break. I mean, I had a one month break. You have a one month, you have a one month break before your PE exam, professional exams. Please just stay at home and study, all right? Don't do anything else because that one month is going to help you a lot, all right? Uh, it, the exam, the professional exam is not easy. It was a tough journey, all right? It's, it was really hard. If you see me back then, you probably be afraid, right? So uh, this, this is a very important exam too. It's a very, it's a big exam. They want to know if you're ready to move on to the next stage, right? So you, you again, you can't blame the system. You can't blame the system. You have to prepare for it, right? You have to know uh, where you're, what you're weak at. If you're weak at uh, biochemistry, then focus on that. And then the lectures, most lectures, I'm not promoting tailors or anything, but most lectures in, in tailors are actually very helpful. Uh, I can name some of them, but it's fine. Uh, some of them, they, they treat you like, like your family, you know, uh, they, you ever need help, you can text them. Uh, some of them don't like that. So please make sure you ask them before, you know, reaching out. You can text them. Some prefer email, so you email them. And uh, some are willing to give you a whole lecture. If you just like meet them uh, during like office hours, they'll give you a whole lecture. If it's just, just face to face, it's one on one, right? If they have the time. So don't be afraid to approach uh, your lecturers. They, they might seem scary and all. Uh, some of them actually, uh, I, was, I was intimidated by some of them too, but don't be afraid. They're actually very nice people. Uh, and then they'll help you all the way. They'll help you all the way. Some of them help you in other ways as well. If you're struggling with other things, like some of them, they can sense that, you know, you're just you're not doing well uh, mentally or emotionally. They approach you and they're just like, is everything okay? And that's important, right? They're always there for you. And don't just like push them away and just like walk off. Like, you know, I don't need your help. Medicine is uh, hard enough. You're making my life hard. Don't try and get into this. Right, they're always there for you. You can always talk to them. Most of them are approachable, right? Don't be afraid, go up to them. All right. So once you're done with PE, you'll be super happy because it's one of the biggest exams of your life, and you're just like, I made it, I made it. And then you move on to clinicals, and you're just like, wow, I don't remember anything. Because you get another one month break before you start clinicals, and that in that one break, one month break, you forget everything. All right. So uh I'm not saying study in that one month break, you deserve it because you Past the PE, not easy to do, right? But once once you're in clinicals, life gets a lot more serious. You start going to hospital. Uh, I mean, now you can't because of uh, the pandemic. But don't worry. Uh, hopefully, things get better soon, right? But uh, it, it makes a huge difference uh, learning in the hospitals and uh, just doing theory because when you see patients, uh, it's like practice. You see them, you speak to them. It's it's very different, trust me. Like you learn a lot better, you pick up easier, faster, and uh, you will like it. If you actually enjoy doing medicine, you will, you will like it a lot more compared to uh, preclinicals. That's why all the seniors will tell you, oh my God, uh, clinicals is a lot more better than uh, preclinicals. They're not wrong, but it doesn't mean it's easier, you know? It's just very different. If you enjoy it, yeah, you, but the thing is that you have on calls, uh, so like on some days, uh, you are scheduled to go to the hospital, uh, in the evening and, uh, because you have to present to the next day. So you have to clock patients, be there for a few hours because not everyone's talk to you. And now uh, you have to understand that it's a privilege that we get to even like disturb these patients and ask them to like, you know, help us out for our studies. So I'll get, I'll get to that later. Right. Patient, uh, doctor, patient communication, or even student patient communication. That's very important. All right. I'll get to that later. Anyways. So that is the pathway of studying medicine, all right? So I've already covered some of my experiences uh, in med school. Like I said, uh, it's, been a, it's been a roller coaster, right? It's been crazy, but uh, it's also been good. Like uh, what Kirti said, uh, your friends uh, become your family because five years is a very long time. Even the first two years, you just, you see the same faces every day. Same faces every day for I don't know how many hours. <laughs> Sometimes you get tired, but you have no choice. <laughs> you see the same faces day after day. You'll get used to it. It's, it's a routine. And uh, it's every day is a it's it's a, it's a new day, right? Uh, our timetables uh, isn't the same. Every week is different. You, you it's a different chapter. It's not Monday. It's not like this week and next week the same timetables, but you learn different things. Uh, for our school, they give you like for each block they give you a, a prepared timetable. 
So uh, I know some some students from other schools have like set timetables every week, the same thing. But uh, for medicine, Monday to Friday, you have classes. It's only on some days where you don't have classes, public holidays or like if you have like, uh, if the lecturer can't make it, if, there's, uh, if you already replaced the classes, only then you have uh, off days. But apart from that, Monday to Friday, you're at, uh, you're at school. You have no choice, right? But make use of it, make use of it. I know some of us get tired. I saw some of the comments on the live stream earlier. Some of us get tired, right? But uh, you have to keep going. You know, it's if you give up, uh, you're never gonna, gonna know what it's like to get there, right? So don't don't give up yet. You know, you see you see other people. You, see, you talk to seniors, right? If you ever if you ever want to talk to me, hit me up, right? I'll give you advice. Right? I'll help you out. Someone asked. Someone asked. I you gave us advice about anatomy, right? On point, right? You see, you draw, you draw for anatomy. You draw, and you know if you know you draw and you know what you're drawing, you're good. You don't have to just memorize it. When you, once you draw it, draw it a few times, it'll stick in your head, right? And that's actually very important because the, that's uh, they ask you a lot of questions uh, on like drawing alone, like draw the tympanic membrane, draw the uh, cross section of the brain, this that, right? Blood supply of the brain, right? Circle of villus, all these things, right? You need to know. So practice, practice, draw. And even if you're not good at art, doesn't matter. I'm terrible at art, right? My drawings are not very pretty, right? But just do it, right? It's, it's, a, it's a learning process, right? You get used to it. I enjoy it. I'm terrible at drawing, but I enjoy it, right? So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that was my experience. And uh, now I wanna give uh, some advice for the aspiring medical students, everyone uh, listening, right? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, doctor patient communication. This is a uh, very serious because uh, what I see uh, nowadays is uh, students, you don't really know how to communicate well with the patients. We have this uh, subject back in preclinicals. We have uh, communica communication skills for medicine, I guess it's called communication skills in medicine, right? For most of us, uh, Mr. Nama taught us and I'm very sure no one really pays attention to Mr. Nama because he's a very old, nice man, right? And people always abuse this kind of <laughs> teachers, you know? This is very nice. You don't care if you're not paying attention, right? But please, uh, I know it, it sounds easy because there are exams of communication skills, but everyone's just like, oh, it's English. Right? Just, it's like an English paper. It's easy. I can do it in like a few minutes. I'm done. Because that's what most people do. They sit in there uh, in 15 minutes the, out of the exam hall, right? I get it's easy for you to study these things, but practicing it and like, Practicing it in real life is not the same, right? Communication skills is something you attain when you, you do it often, right? And uh, what I've seen, you know, not just in juniors, in my classmates as well, uh, and I remember I'm in year four, right? My classmates as well, they have terrible communication skills, right? Especially with patients, right? When the patient tells you no, take it as no, right? They, they don't give you consent, then don't clock them. Go move ahead, find another patient. You, you cannot complain like, oh my God, uh, we're here. Uh, it is supposed to like, you know, let us clock them. It's going to take a few minutes. Some, some, some students will tell them, oh, it's only going to take a few minutes. And uh, they end up sitting there and, uh, you know, talking to the patient for an hour. And the patient's already in pain. Some of them are in pain. You don't know what they're going through, right, uh, physically or mentally. So you need to consider all these things, all right? Don't just do things. This is like, I know I'm paying my fees, so I get to be here for as long as I want. I get to do, I get to talk to them. I get to do this. I get to do that. No. You have to respect the patients and also remember you have to respect the doctors there in the hospital as well. That's also very important, right? You see, uh, it doesn't matter, a houseman, medical officer, specialist, surgeon, doesn't matter who it is, you see them, you greet them, right? Very important. I know it doesn't, some of them don't, they don't even respond to you. They don't care even if you don't greet them, but as a sign of respect, greet them. You're in their space, right? You're in their space, you're in their way. So just greet them. It doesn't take much, right? Just good morning, good afternoon, good evening. If they ask you why you're here, tell them why you're here, right? If they say no, try to explain why you're actually here. I right? just say, I'm actually supposed, I'm, I'm, on, I'm on call right now. I'm supposed to clock a patient because I'm supposed to present for a case presentation tomorrow. If they say no again, you go to a different ward, right? Don't argue, don't start anything with these people because they're in charge of that, right? You're just visitors, right? So just please respect the patients and the doctors, very important, especially the patients. Now, you don't know, you honestly, I really mean, I say, you don't know what they're going through. Don't harass them. Don't, don't tell them, it's like, oh, just, just, just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes. Let me, let me, let me just uh, talk to you for a while, right? And then you sit down there and uh, you, also when you're taking, uh, taking a uh, patient history, don't spend too long, right? 
Uh, so I've, I've witnessed before where patients get tired when you sit down there and you ask too many questions, right? You, you have to learn. That's why I say you do it often. Practice on your friends. Watch videos. YouTube is actually nowadays very helpful. Talk to your seniors. I'm pretty sure KT would love to help you out, right? I want to take a history from KT about bronchial asthma, right? You can come to me. Uh, Shannon, uh, you want to list any diseases? All right, so please come, come to us. We'll help you out, right? I've had very helpful seniors, uh, great seniors, honestly, and uh, they've helped me out a lot. Physical examination as well. Right now, we haven't been going to hospitals as of often because of the pandemic, and we've lost touch of our uh, examination skills, right? But those are very important because without your physical examination, you can't reach a diagnosis, right? You can't, reach, you can't get your differentials. The history is good enough, but the physical examination helps a lot right so keep practicing like uh, i think kirti or shana, shana i think shana mentioned practice on your friends right talk to them right uh if your family members any of your family members has any uh conditions just just ask them about it right because then you you know firsthand what they're going through what's going on so you learn right uh physical examination practice on your friends don't see what what's the harm right if Kitty wants to practice on me, I'll let him do it. Right, Kitty? Yeah, I can practice on him too. He'll allow me, all right? All right. Very important, right? Practice. I, I, I'm not saying this because like, I'm, I'm an expert at like physical examination, but I, I forget a lot of things too. And the lectures remind you, right? Sometimes nicely, sometimes sarcastically, because they already expect you to know. When you're, I'm in year four already, you should, you should know all this by now. But because uh, there's a lack of practice, because we rarely get to go to hospitals nowadays, we, we forget, you know? So reminder to everyone out there and to myself as well, always practice, okay? And uh, one more thing, uh, something about uh, something about Kirti or something about something Kirti mentioned, target high, right? That's a good thing. Uh, target high uh, is, a, is a very good thing, right? Because uh, most of our exams are, are tough. Uh, some of y'all put a lot of extra effort. That's great, right? Don't forget to have time for yourself. That's very important because uh, if you get lost, uh, if you let medicine consume you, then you won't be that big. You won't be that great of a doctor. Honestly, you need to you need to understand yourself to take care of yourself too, right? And uh, always expect anything. Always expect anything, especially when it comes to exams and all. Uh, I'll I'll give you an example. So I was doing my professional exams. I was studying uh, anatomy. Uh, they asked us about the eardrum, the tympanic membrane. Uh, in class, when we read it, it seemed like it's a very small thing. And me and my friends were like, oh yeah, they can't really ask this uh, as an essay question, you know, because essay questions are worth 10 marks. And we were like, yeah, they can't really ask us this. And uh, when we came to the professional exams, just they asked us to draw the eardrum and describe it. And it was worth 10 marks, right? So don't, don't just uh, depend on like, oh, we have passes or my senior told me this, this senior told me that I can focus on this. Uh, people can help you out. Can, people can give you tips, but always pay attention to class and expect anything, right? Because they can throw anything at you, you won't see it coming. So that's all I have. Good luck for everyone. Uh, if you all join Taylor's, uh, hopefully we get to meet. All right, thank you, Rishan. So there are a few questions. Uh, the first one is, how do you prepare for the interview? All right, uh, so I, I was super nervous uh, for the interview. I'm actually nervous for, uh, all the time, right? So I was never super nervous for the interview, but Honestly, uh, it's not an easy thing to prepare for because uh, you don't know what they're going to ask you, right? I did not expect them. Uh, of course, everyone just thinks they're going to ask you, like, uh, what you want to do medicine. And so you prepare, you prepare a whole script for this. And then when you go in there, they ask you about chemistry and just like, wow, what? What's going on? So don't prepare. Don't over-prepare. Just know, like I said, just know you want to do medicine. So even if they, 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 they will ask you that at some point. So why do you want to do medicine? And uh, of course, everyone will give the usual response, like you know, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been inspired. I've been inspired by some doctors here and there. My my parents are doctors. Some of y'all will say my parents forced me. Whatever, whatever it is, right? How do you prepare for it? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, again, uh, expect anything. Uh, if you're fresh uh, out of uh, pre-U, then just keep in mind. Just remember some chemistry, bio. They won't ask you physics or maths, right? Because they they actually ask me bio and chemistry questions. So uh, I, I would advise you all to just remember like uh, the major uh, things from chemistry and bio. So, because they, they will ask you that. And uh, apart from that is just, they will ask you about yourself. 
honestly, uh, for me, they ask my hobbies. They ask my hobbies. Uh, what do you like doing in free time? I don't know why they asked me that, but uh, it just seemed important because a lot of people ask the same questions. So just look out for these questions. Why you want to do medicine? Some things from your pre you and you know, things about yourself. That should be good enough. Okay, thank you. And the next one is, how do you prepare yourself mentally if you start your first year of medical school in an online platform during this pandemic? Uh, okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Uh, honestly, I don't know how most of, uh, most of the juniors are doing it because I can't, I can't imagine doing it. Uh, you, you need people around you. Also, like, it's different studying online and studying in a classroom. You have a question in class, you can just walk up to a teacher after class and just ask them and they'll just explain to you immediately. But in this sense, it's not the same because you're miles away. And uh, there's, there can be a lot of miscommunications because it's, it's, it's all online, right? So uh, how do you mentally prepare for it? Honestly, uh, I don't have the best answer. You just, first of all, hope that the pandemic goes away quick because you actually, honestly, we, all, we are all missing out. We're all missing out. The pre-clinical students, the clinical students, we're all missing out. So we, we have a responsibility to spread the message to our, our family members, our friends, remind everyone to keep practicing the SOP, SOPs, right? Stay safe and all that so that we can go back, you know, to school and learn what we're supposed to learn, right? And how you prepare yourself mentally is that just know that people can do it. Like what Katie mentioned, nothing is impossible, right? Uh, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that it's, it's harder. So for this time being, just put in that little uh, effort, until things go back to normal. And if you ever need help, uh, you can reach out to the seniors. Like honestly, I don't know if everyone will be there for you, but some of us, uh, well, most of us, actually all of us, me, KT and Shannon, we're all from uh, the Taylor University Medical Society, reach out to us and we're always there, right? To help in any way. So if you, you don't know how to prepare mentally for uh, this, just reach out to us and we can help you out. Right, thank you. And the next one is, how has COVID impacted both pre and post clinical phases? All right, uh, like I, men I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, how COVID has affected the the current the clinical the clinical uh, phase is that we don't get to go to the hospital, so we don't get to talk to patients, we don't get to examine patients, and that is bad, right? Because you can practice it on a you can practice it on a mannequin, but it's not enough because let's just say the mannequin is all they all look fit. Right? I don't know why all the mannequins always look fit. And you go to the hospital, right? You, have, you, you, you come across obese patients, overweight patients, some patients just extremely uh, thin, right? And you need to know the different ways, like the different maneuvers to go around, like how to examine this patient. That's why it's affected us a lot, right? You want to look for the apex beat in a, in, on a mannequin, easy, right? Anyone can do it, right? You know, you just, you just look at the mannequin, you know where to put your hand. But <laughs> you go to the hospital, because I, I faced this problem like two weeks ago. I went to the hospital. And uh, it was a heart failure patient. Uh, it was an obese patient, right? Obese patient, she had fluid retention. So her abdomen was distended. And it was a female as well. So uh, I had to palpate for her apex beat. And I struggled. I struggled because in a, in a heart failure patient, the apex beat gets displaced. And uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's weak. So you can barely feel it. And you also don't want to keep like touching the patient for too long. You know, they're going to be like disturbed. But also a reminder uh, to all uh, medical students, always have a chaperone when you're doing all these things, right? Very important. Don't do it alone, right? And always close the curtains, right? Important, right? Remember. So uh, we're missing out a lot. You're missing out a lot because when you go, when you, when you start working, you become a houseman, doesn't matter houseman, medical officer, anything, you will meet patients of different sizes, colors, I don't know, different backgrounds, right? So when you go to hospital, you're exposed to all these things, right? That's how it helped us to just learn better, faster, right? And you get, you get, you have access to the patient, uh, patient's investigations, the x-rays, the ECGs and all that. So you just, you can take it, uh, you can take uh, what they have there and you can interpret it there and then. But now, uh, since everything's online, we clock the patient online. The, our lecturers still bring patients, uh, get them on Zoom. Some of them don't know how to use Zoom. So that's a struggle. That's a massive struggle. Some of them have terrible connections. So we can't even get that process done properly. We can't even have like a complete history. And that's, that's just, it's been a major setback for us. 
but uh, hopefully, but they they've been improving. They've been learning from their mistakes, and they've been improving. So hopefully things get better. We've gone to the hospital a few times already. Hopefully after vaccinations are given out, we get to continue going because uh, I'm almost done. I have one more year left, and I need all the practice I can get. So for the preclinicals, uh, I would say you guys aren't missing out as much. I'm not saying I'm not saying you guys are missing out at all, right? I know lah, but <laughs> you know you guys are missing out but not as much, right? Because it's, it's theory. I know it's not easy reading textbooks because uh, I have a bunch of textbooks and honestly, they're all quite dusty. Uh, they, it's, it's not very helpful, right? The lectures give you uh, lecture slides. Those are gold, right? Read them. Read them when they, when during class, <laughs> they give you a lecture, write notes. They will, they, will, they will mention little things here and there during class and you will see it on the exam paper and then you'll hate yourself hate yourself it's like why did i not pay attention i heard i remember dr reka mentioning this in class and then now uh, i can't remember it because it's been like months right so pay attention to what they say right textbooks are not easy right but now there's a lot of online materials stat pearls you know uh, ncbi stat pearls look that up it's uh they just cover a lot of diseases it's pretty helpful and uh, there's a lot of other ways to study right like i said again any any help any guidance reach out to us all right, thank you. And one more, uh, during the clinical years, do we still attend lectures slash lessons or is it just being in hospitals? All right, so uh, when I started, it was, uh, there was a fixed schedule, right? It was supposed to be at the hospital every day from Monday to Friday at 8 a.m. It was not easy, it was such a pain, right? But uh, 8 a.m., we had to be at the hospital because we had to be prepared with a case. Prepared with, we were all supposed to clock a patient each. We were all supposed to be prepared with a case. And uh, then we have something called uh, bedside teaching. So the lecturer or the doctor comes to the ward and they'll ask us, all right, so what case do you have? What case do you have? What case do you clock? And then we tell them what cases we have and uh, whatever they feel like, you know, sometimes we already have like a roster. So uh, I'll present today, Kirti will present tomorrow, Shannon will present on Wednesday, something like that. Or, or sometimes the lecturer picks on whatever case he feels like teaching today, right? So then they bring you to the patient. It's called bedside teaching for a reason. They bring you to the patient and we have the lecture there while standing, right? Just mind the no seats, right? For an hour, we'll be standing around the patient, right? And there will just uh, be someone, the person who clocked the patient will present the case. And then later, we all will uh, do an exam. Uh, the, the doctor or the, the person who clocked the patient will do the examination on the patient. And then they'll correct us on what we did wrong, what we missed out. And after that, they'll bring us to the side and they'll have a small discussion on it. Uh, so that's bedside teaching and normally after bedside teaching you have lunch break and after lunch break you go to uh, Taylor's Clinical School TCS and you have lectures or CBLs. Uh, CBL stands for uh, case-based learning so they give you like scenarios short short scenarios and uh, you have a discussion with your batchmates or with the lecture itself so you have lectures CBLs in classrooms right normal classrooms or even seminars so like presentations some topics, uh, instead of the lecture, the lecturer, the doctor uh, give, teaching you, uh, we have to teach ourselves, right? Uh, apart from that, yeah, you have on calls. On calls, so as I say, it's, it's also uh, on a roster. So uh, each day, there's a different group of people going to the hospital in the evening to clock patients, and the next day, they will present. So that's how it's like in uh, the clinical side. All right, so we have one question for all of you, I guess. <laughs> is diabetes a condition or a disease? <sighs> Let me think. Is this a test? I don't know, but it seemed pretty interesting. So <laughs> I thought I'd ask. Well, uh, Normally, when I, I was doing my case right before this, so when I was writing that, we, we try to rule out chronic diseases uh, such as hypertension and uh, diabetes and all. So I think, uh, oh, sometimes we call it chronic illnesses. So I think uh, I will go with. It's a condition that could lead to several diseases because yeah, it, it, diabetes is dangerous, honestly. Oh, diabetes is uh, scary. Uh, it can lead to a lot of things. There's a lot to learn about diabetes. Honestly, you can read about diabetes for a year and you're not done, right? So like what I said earlier, it's a condition that could lead to uh, various other diseases. Right. So let's just see if there are any questions because for now, 
there are no more. Um, sorry, just to add on one more thing that I think all of us actually missed out. It's quite important that if you're coming from IGCSE, um, I'm pretty sure you don't have an SPM BM. Because in IGCSE, that BM that you do is not a MMC qualification. So you need to get an SPM BM a pass. At, at the moment, the requirement is you need to get a pass for SPM BM. You can, for tailors, you can take it um, anytime. Uh, within your five years before you graduate, you need to obtain that pass certificate for your SBMBM to practice for housemanship. Um, but it is more advisable if you have your SBMBM qualification before you go to clinical years because um, in the hospital, we use a lot of BM to communicate with patients. So it is good that if you can you know, um, master your BM and communication in BM before you get to clinical years. And... One more thing is that um, at the moment, our requirement is just a pass in SPM BM. However, previously, there has been like changes to it. It depends on like the supply of doctors. Sometimes they change the requirement to you need SPM and also history, uh, sajara. But at the moment, it's just BM and they only need a pass. But sometimes um, along the way, when there's you know oversupply of doctors, they just change the requirement to a credit. So they want you to get a C for SPM BM. So when you study medicine, you have to like um, check out and follow along the way and find out like what is the current requirement. Personally, for me, I did IGCSE and I will tell you it is safer to obtain above the C. So you no need to worry when they change the requirement to credit. So when you do your paper, just make sure you get above credit. And if you are like um, afraid they might change to uh, requiring um, sajara or history, then you can just study it and take it together, like the SPM, BM, and the Sajara. You are taking it as a private candidate in another like a school that they will assign you to. Yeah, I want to add on to that. Uh, BM, I think Kirti mentioned it earlier too. Now Shannon just uh, spoke about it. BM is a very important, it's our national language. So please, uh, if you're Malaysian, you, you have to be able to speak BM because uh, most of these hospitals, uh, most of the patients come from rural areas. Uh, you try to speak English with them, you won't get much for the history. So it's always better if you speak their language. You, you, it also makes them feel comfortable. Uh, they would feel, uh, I don't know, they feel better around you when you speak their language, you know. And also when you're, when you're taking a history, don't just be all serious. I know you want to get the job done and go back home or have your lunch or something, but you, you have to understand the patient, right? So you speak to them as if you're speaking to, like what Katie mentioned, the, the human, the human as well. So speak to them. Don't treat them as a patient, treat them as a person, right? Just another person. That's it. Okay, uh, one thing I would like to mention here is that I'm not promoting Taylor's, okay? But just to let you guys know, my personal experience, Taylor's, what's good? Okay, because I've not been to other med schools, so we have got the best seniors here, okay? So, for example, I was in my first year, first sem. And Dishan here was sitting, was preparing for his professional examination one. And he was walking towards the shops. And I was walking. And then I was like, okay, maybe he's a medical student. And then I just approached him. And he was like, okay, here you go. Here's my number. And that's how, that's, how, that's how I met him. And since then, he has been helping me out through many things. We are also in the medical society. So in there as well as my studies. And not only him, I've got a senior from the final semester, um, fifth year. He himself approached me. He asked me um, if I'm facing any difficulties because I just entered my third year, my clinical year, right? So the, the transition might be a bit difficult. So what he has been doing is uh, he has been having one-to-one -one sessions with me every single weekend. On top of his preparations for professional examination too, he's going to graduate soon. He spends his time, he allocates his time for me. So that's how supportive, that's how encouraging our seniors are. And we do not have the thing called pride. Like, I'm a senior to you, so you have to respect me. No such thing as that. Okay, so we walk together like, hey, bro, how are you? Okay, so that's how med school tailors works. And this is the main point that I would say many schools or many other med schools that do not have. You know how they have this hierarchy of I'm a senior, you have to respect me and all these things. So, yep, uh, that's 
Right. Another question would be, so if, for example, you want to go uh, do residency in the UK or uh, US, other countries, and you have to do their uh, exams as well, what is the workload like if you're also trying to study for those? Is it very different? And does it add a lot to your workload? Um, they usually recommend like exams like US and Italy. And what happens with US and Italy is, yeah, the workload is extra from what you are studying currently because the things that you're tested on are like more details compared to what you are tested here. So yeah, it will add on to your workload those kind of exams. And just now I saw a question on whether you need SPM, BM if you're an international student. Um, if you're an international student, you're not required to take SPM, BM because you won't be doing your housemanship practice in Malaysia. However, um, in Taylor's or I think other med school as well, during your preclinical years, there will be compulsory BM classes for international students to take so that you don't struggle so much during your clinical years. I, I agree with Shannon. It definitely adds on to your workload. I think by mile a lot, right? Because as it is, uh, I mean, for me, I feel like the workload now is already enough, right? Because you need time. For, again, you need time for yourself. You have family, you have friends. You have, you have a life to live. Right? I know people have goals to uh, achieve and all, but take it easy. If you, if you really want to do it, then go ahead. But make sure you can manage med school at the same time. That's it. So with that, I guess that is all of the questions from the chat. So yeah, I guess we can just take it here and end the session here. But thank you so much to our three guest speakers, Shannon, Kriti, and Rishan. Very insightful. And hopefully you guys were able to learn a lot as well. Hopefully inspiring you as well to continue your journey with medicine. Uh, if you do have anything, do remember to reach out to us. Uh, hopefully you have our Instagram and we'll leave that in the description for this video, uh, as well as that of Taylor's U uh, Medical Society. And do keep in touch, as they mentioned, very nice people. So yeah, make, make use. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Right, thank you so much. We'll see you. Your time today. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Bye bye. Good luck.